so this is Mr. Hawkins, our rooster. We have one rooster and seven hens. <laughs> we have a few varieties of chickens. We love them all dearly. We have one who I'm guessing our mascot, her name is Cleo. She is the only one that's able to get out of the coop, but she always sneaks back in before we put them up. So we let her hang out. Um, but she has a beautiful like crown, much like this chicken who has kind of these feathers sticking up on her head that look like a crown. And we're very into hyping up our residents and making sure they know their queen. So we always say that Cleo with her crown is our mascot. Welcome to the sixth episode of the 98% Life After Prison, a show focusing on more than the 22,000 people who are released from North Carolina's prisons each year and what it truly means to give someone a second chance. In this episode, we're going to visit one of the very few residential programs for women in North Carolina. Benevolence Farm was founded by social worker Tanya Gisa, who was profoundly disturbed by the rising numbers of recidivism among women leaving prison. She set about to develop a farm-based residential program designed to address their many complex needs and set them up for success. Tucked away in rural Alamance County, Benevolence Farm received its first residence in 2016 and has steadily expanded its staff and its services ever since. We'll begin our visit by taking a tour of the farm to learn how Benevolence Farm has managed to incorporate their farm enterprise into their transition program, enabling them to pay their residents a living wage. Here's Brett Rapkin Citronbaum to describe how the farm's seasonal crop of herbs and flowers are transformed into body care products, which are sold online and at the local farmer's market. I'm Brett Rapkin Citronbaum, and I'm the employment coach at Benevolence Farm. So I oversee the residence workday, and I manage the farm and the enterprise side, and I uh, teach a course on job readiness in the green economy to the residents, and then I help them prepare as they're leaving for their next employment. So we have a 13-acre farm and we grow mostly herbs and flowers, and then we process those herbs and flowers into infused oil. And then we're able to make body care products and candles out of them. And the body care products have medicinal properties of the different herbs and flowers that we grow. And the candles are able to smell that way. And so it's not only we're doing farming, but we're also teaching about owning a business, um, how to do value add products. And we're also, because of the higher cost of those products, we're able to pay our residents um, a living wage of $15 an hour. What makes this farm sustainable? Um, <laughs> I'm laughing because the residents hear me say that word like 4,000 times a day and they roll their eyes. But we use that word in a lot of different ways. So we a, try new sustainable farming practices. We are no-till. Um, we don't use pesticides or fertilizers that are unnatural chemical fertilizers. And we try and work with the land. But we also think about the program as something we hope to be sustainable. We want the residents not only to have a place to live and meet their basic needs, but also be able to leave here and be thriving. So we have mostly raised beds because the soil here is not awesome. So the raised beds gives, gives us the opportunity to grow um, with soil that we bring in. And it also is a little bit more accessible for folks who have never farmed before or who might have some physical limitations uh, so you don't have to bend down as far with the raised beds. We have nine rows. Each row 
differs from year to year and depending on the season. So right now that back row, we have some greens that were pretty much just holding space and keeping the soil healthy during the winter, um, but also for the residents to eat. We have some mustard greens, kale and collards. And then the second row also has some greens as well as some resting beds with uh, hay and mulch on top. And then the third row, we have our mint, which is recently pruned, so it is super happy. This is peppermint. And so we put peppermint in our muscle rub because it has a lot of medicinal qualities that support uh, muscle soreness healing. And so we harvest it um, and then we dry it out and when it's dried we're able to make it into the infused oil and yeah that's how we're able to infuse all of our products with stuff we grow on the farm and we also have catnip which is also in the mint family and so one of the cool things we can do is kind of adapt to whatever the residents want to do and are good at and want to grow those skills. So last winter we had a resident who loved to crochet. So we were able to use our catnip and she crocheted uh, cat toys that included the catnip in them. And um, those sold really well and people seem to like those a lot. So what has been the biggest challenge in establishing and having this enterprise program support itself? Well, it doesn't fully support itself right now. Um, we are able to raise a good amount of money through the products that we, that goes back into the residents' living wages, but not all of it. We're not able to fully pay them out of the profits. Um, and then we also aren't able to use any of the funds right now to pay for the supplies we need, pay, pay for my salary and that kind of things. But the goal ultimately is to support the residents and give them a lot of knowledge about as many paths as they can take as possible because although farming is a great opportunity for formerly incarcerated incarcerated folks because there is less traditionally less uh, discrimination based on that in the farm world it's not the an option that makes sense for a lot of our residents so we want to give them more tools um so yeah, we've been really lucky. There's a lot of good markets in Alamance County that we're able to attend. And then we also do a lot of sales online. But yeah, we are a small operation. So we can't always keep up with big orders, which we need um, as quickly as we want to. And um, we also aren't a always able to get the word out um, as much as we wish we could. I'm so lucky to work somewhere with where I like all my coworkers. I don't think that's the norm. <laughs> it, I really get the sense of family. Yeah, we definitely, it's a labor of love here. And we're all very close, <laughs> sometimes too close. <laughs> the farm operation is a wonderful program for those who are just transitioning back into society. Women are often left behind and have fewer opportunities than men, and Benevolence Farm gives them a good insight as to how to provide for themselves and their families, as well as learning a trade that can make them a productive member of society. Yeah, I have to say, April, I'm really impressed with how comprehensive Benevolence Farm's programs are. Through their farm enterprise, residents not only have an opportunity to make a living wage, they're also able to acquire a variety of skills, skills like how to operate a business, sustainable farming, even leadership skills. And that's only part of their transition program. The staff works closely with each resident to address their individual needs, whether that be treatment for substance abuse, reuniting with their children, or help finding housing and employment. Next, we're going to hear from a former resident that has since joined the staff of Benevolence Farm. As enterprise assistant, Mona Evans works alongside the residents to teach them how to make their body care and candle products. She also serves as an advocate for the residents to make it easier for them to reunite with their children after incarceration. Mm. 
My name is Mona Evans, and we are at Benevolence Farm. So how did the process work coming to Benevolence Farm, and how long were you a resident? So once I filled out the application, you go through like numerous interviews with the staff members here. After my initial interview, I think it was about four weeks before I got accepted. So when I came home to the farm, when I got welcomed here, I actually had like a lot of my favorite things on my bed that I liked. I had a journal. I expressed to them in my interview that I like to journal sometimes. I picked up crocheting also when I was in prison. So I had, they had me a lot of yarn here also when I got here for crocheting. Um, Once that's done, you go through what we call onboarding process. The process for that is basically so a lot of people that comes home from prison, you don't have your documents and things like that. So that's what that process is to help you get off those. If you want to apply for like food assistance and you don't know how to do it, staff help you with those things. So one thing that stood out to me and made me want to actually come here was for the simple fact that they offered housing and employment. And for me, when I was going through all these different programs and looking into programs, that was the my top two resources I needed. And a lot of the programs that I were applying, was applying for, some of them would say, okay, we offer housing, but it's, you have a limit of 90 days to stay here. Or if that was the case, they do offer housing for long term, but you can't work for six months or you can't, or you have to find a job within the community in six months. So I knew with me being a felon, it was going to be hard for me to find employment. And I was kind of stressing out about that because I'm like, well, how do I, you know, find a place that's going to meet all my needs in one? What happened to your children while you were in prison? Um, My son stayed here in North Carolina. He did have a, his great grandmother um lived here so he stayed here my daughters went home back to Michigan to their father um they my daughters bounced around a lot during my incarceration period so that's kind of like why my last four months of you know about to get released I was kind of so much focused on finding a program that can help me get on my feet as soon as possible so I can get my children back so Um, Yeah, they kind of bounced around a lot during my incarceration. Stay tuned. When we come back, Mona will describe some of the unique challenges formerly incarcerated women face, especially when it comes to reuniting with their children. I do completely take, you know, accountability for what I done, what I've done, and I do understand why I was in prison. But I can say the prison system did not help me become the person I am today. I didn't, you know, become the person I am today until I came to Benevolence Farm. They have contributed to the woman that I am and the mother that I am now because of the things that I learned here. So. They have done a lot for me. And one thing I can say um, is very important to me also. This program for me has not just been a program. It's been very family oriented. By me being from Michigan, I came here, you know, I don't didn't know a soul. I didn't have any relatives here, you know. So I was lacking emotional support. I was lacking a lot of, you know, the community support and when I came to this program, like I found that um, not only did this program give me the means to actually get my children back in, in such a short period of time. So the at Benevolence Farm, you can initially stay here for two years. I actually did this program for five months before I was able to transition out and get my own place and things like that. Um, a lot of people might think it's very easy, but with me being a felon, believe me, I had a lot of barriers stacked against me. Um, even with finding employment and housing outside of the farm was extremely hard for me. Benevolence helped me. Like they were literally there 
for me every single step of the way. So from day one, during my interview process, I was very open with them and honest about my situation. I told them, you know, hey, I'm, I don't want to be here for, for two years. I have three children. This is my plans. This is my goals. This is what I want to do. And this is what I need to do to get there. And they literally helped me every step of the way to accomplish that. So often the focus is on incarcerated men and getting out of prison. People do are not so aware of incarcerated women and the challenges they face. Can you speak to the unique challenges you think that women face and um, what the public needs to know about incarcerated women and women getting out of prison in transition? Um, I think, like you said, the focus has always been on men being incarcerated. Even prior to my incarceration, I was the first woman in my family to ever be incarcerated. So prior to my incarceration, for me, it was always a men thing when you t- when you talk about incarceration. But there's a, a lot of support as far as men coming home from prison. There's not a lot of support back in women that's coming home from prison. And not just, you know, the emotional support, but a lot of us are mothers. So, you know, the not only was incarceration traumatic to me, but also being separated from my children. Like, that was very traumatic for me. So, you know, just trying to come home and get your life back in order and then trying to deal with trying to get your children back, like, that's just a whole (laughs) different story. I don't know how many men that were incarcerated now and prior to incarceration, you know, they were the so provided for their children or that they had, you know, they were the only parent that the children had. I'm not really sure. So I'm not, I can't really speak on it, but I know a lot of women that's incarcerated are the sole parent to their children. So a lot of women, you know, when they go to prison, their kids end up in foster care if, you know, a loved one can't take them. So we, as women that are incarcerated and trying to come home, we bear a lot of you know, I would say the emotional impact, the financial impact, you know, we bear a lot of that. What made you decide once you were a resident here that you wanted to become part of the staff? I love making the products and the body care products and all of our candles are amazing. So to learn that aspect was really cool also. And now that I'm actually a staff member, I'm actually the enterprise assistant here also. And then I'm also the family reunification project manager. So as the enterprise assistant, I'm basically still doing the same things that I was doing when I was a resident, resident, but now I'm more supervising of the making of those products and the candles and things like that. Um, As the family reunification project manager, we are working on a program to assist other mothers um, that's coming home from prison. And basically the same story that I just shared with you with the struggles that I faced as far as, you know, trying to get my kids back. We want to make it, you know, more impactful and more easier for women to be able to transition transition out so that they can get their children back at a, you know, a very quick period of time. Because we understand how imperative it is when women come home from prison, you know, to get with their kids as soon as possible because of the length they've been separated from them. I know that feeling that I felt after, you know, being reunited with my children after so long, like it was a, a feeling that was indescribable. And just for, you know, I remember how I felt when I opened up my key to my apartment and I was able to call my kids and tell them like, hey, I got a house now. Y'all can come back, you know. So just to feel that and to be able to see that on another woman's face, like that's why I decided I wanted to work here and work with this program because I completely, totally and I support their vision and their principles and their values here all the way. The values and the principles that they go by here is what I live by on a daily day basis. Mona, 
Jonah's interview resonated with me in the sense that I was once incarcerated, as we know, and had to reunite with my son. I was fortunate enough to be reunited with him and not lose my rights, um, parental rights, but others aren't always um, as lucky as me. So I think that Mona's interview sheds a lot of insight on how that happens. And Mona's story is one of few that are a victim of not having a self-defense law in North Carolina. Our laws definitely need to be changed. Yeah, she killed someone in self-defense and was charged with second-degree manslaughter. And even though the court recognized that it was self-defense, there was no law to cover that. So she had to serve four years in prison. It's important to keep in mind that with the war on drugs, that according to the Vera Institute, the number of women in North Carolina's prisons has increased more than fivefold, from 446 in 1978 to more than 2,600 in 2017. And although the number of people sent to state prisons and county jails from urban areas has decreased, that number has increased to rise in many rural counties. And women constitute a rising number of those behind bars. Finally, we'll hear from the executive director of Benevolence Farm. Christian Powers arrived at Benevolence in 2017 with a background in criminal justice and the experience of having a loved one in prison. In her interview, Kristen talks about what it means to be the only transition house in North Carolina that welcomes formerly incarcerated women regardless of their criminal record. She also gives her perspective on the criminal justice philosophy that drives Benevolence Farm's approach to reentry. My name is Kristen Powers. I'm the executive director of Benevolence Farm. So we, at this point, really position ourselves as rural reentry experts. We are in a state where 80% of North Carolina is rural. So uh, we kind of consider this farmhouse, which is in Alamance County, as an innovation site where we can learn best practices to support women coming home to rural communities and what infrastructure um, and support systems are needed that make coming home to rural unique. Um, So we are Yes, in a very rural community, one of the benefits of that is we can also support women on the sex offender registry, and that's something um, no other program really offers across the state. But we don't we don't discriminate on conviction type um, or length of incarceration. So often we're sometimes the only choice for women coming home from prison. Um, so that's some of the benefits of our location as well. And some people intentionally come to us because it's more remote and that's something they're more familiar with or something they feel like they need to assist in their return home. Speaking of accepting women on the registry, have you had pushback from the community because you were going to accept women on the registry? We generally have pushback of just accepting people with records, unfortunately. Um, The farmhouse, when it was originally established, there was a lot of community pushback. I know it escalated to the county commissioner's meetings. There was listening sessions. When we opened up our second location in Burlington, we tried to inform the community ahead of time. We went door to door, told them what we were doing, how we have this other farm for the past five years, and here's what we plan to do. Unfortunately, some of our neighbors have not taken kindly to people on the registry, and they often get pinged when someone moves because the regist- you can sign up for registry notifications. Uh, and we have had people try to shut down our second location because they don't believe we should be operating in the city of Burlington. We have definitely had to navigate um, neighborhood pushback. And in our experience, neighbors are often causing more problems than the, the residents. The residents are here to make a new start for themselves. And really, they're very to themselves and don't want to interact with neighbors or do anything that would jeopardize their well-being or their return home. So it's usually not a problem on our end, um, but it has been an experience we've had both at our original location and our second location. How are you funded? We're funded predominantly through individual donors, family foundations, some grants, and then that revenue from the body care sales. You've talked about services a couple of times, and that's a very important aspect of um, reentry. Can you address the services that you offer the women coming out? 
Yeah, the services are where our customization we find is really important. Um, for example, we have some women in substance use recovery, some who are need of mental health support, physical health support, um, family reunification, financial stability, driver's license access, so many different things. So that's where, as part of their onboarding, they're identifying goals that they want to pursue based on their individual challenges and opportunities. So we are often liaising with other organizations to provide that mental health, to provide substance use recovery, to provide um, access to education. Uh, so we don't always do the direct provision of those services, but we're using our networks to connect them to the people that they need to uh, talk to to be able to get what they need. The reason for the second house in Burlington came predominantly from people's feedback that it would be really nice to have a way to focus on getting a full-time job in the community, perhaps on a transportation line without losing their housing. Because it is a big jump, obviously, to go from prison to the farm, but then it's also a big jump when you get all your housing and employment provided at one space, and then you have to go into the community and find all that at once, which is difficult when you go to a housing provider and they say, provide three pay stubs that prove that you can have this job. And if you're leaving Benevolence Farm, like, and you are in the midst of searching for another job, that can be difficult. So our second location is um, housing only, so women are working in the community, but living here. Our criminal legal system really bars people from so many services. And I think the more nonprofit providers and social service providers can understand those issues, um, the more trauma-informed and responsive we can be to helping people returning home and also people who are just trying to get by day to day. So a lot of people would say, but these pe women committed a crime. What would you say to that? Yeah, I think we as humans cause harm in so many different ways and laws um, can change up what that harm, what harm is punishable by law. Um, and so what we do at Benevolence Farm, we, like I said earlier, don't discriminate on conviction type um, because we believe in the dignity and humanity of every single individual and that we are all deserving of these second chances, um, sometimes third, sometimes fourth, and that people deserve homes and um, a way to survive and hopefully thrive and to reconcile too, like if they have caused harm, how, how do they uh, make amends? How do they repair? And how can they maybe break those intergenerational cycles that they're um, a part of? But we also want to systemically look at and analyze like what, what led to this harm being caused? Because it may not be as black and white. I think people often point to like a larceny on your record may just look like, oh, you stole something, but maybe you were struggling to make money or you lost your job and you have five kids to feed. No one was willing to help or there wasn't any place to go. So you stole food for your kids. So I think that's more of an indictment on society than it is necessarily any individual trying to survive. I can empathize with those who don't have as much support once released. It was very challenging to those from what I hear. I was fortunate enough to have the support that I needed, but I do support those organizations that help those reenter into society, especially those that help them connect with their children. You know, in her interview, Christian mentioned how difficult it is to raise money. Well, Benevolence Farm just has six beds. Their second transition house in Burlington accommodates four women. Well, in my experience, writing grants for a reentry house with just four beds, I learned that granting agencies are often more concerned with the number of people being served than what it takes to support people who are returning from prison without any of the financial, emotional, or logistical supports required to successfully reintegrate into their communities. And without those supports, too many people just end up back in prison. That's our show for today and the final show for this season. We're going to take a break while I have my shoulder replaced, which will put production on hold for a couple of months. But we'll be back in the fall with a second season of the 98% Life After Prison, with many more stories about the men and women leaving prison to rejoin our communities throughout North Carolina. 
In our second season, we'll explore critical issues like mental health, addiction, and family reunification. We'll learn the insidious way that the court fines and fees and other institutional barriers make it especially hard for formerly incarcerated people to rebuild their lives. So join us next time for another episode of the 98% Life After Prison. See you next time.